How do you make a list of the top 10 black metal albums of all time? To be honest, you can't. Black metal is one of the most deeply rooted and complicated branches of the heavy metal family tree. It sprawls across vast regions over four decades. There are as many subgenres and hybrids as ways to wear corpse paint. And you'd be hard pressed to compare classic Venom with the latest Death Spell Omega. So let's just not. Previously on Lockhorns, we debated the first and second waves of black metal. We included 80s bands like Bathory and Celtic Frost, who forged the prototype for this extreme sound, and discussed the legends of the Norwegian black metal scene of the 1990s. Now, it's time to dig even deeper into the early years of black metal, from lo-fi to high pitch, full moon to moon fog. Today on Lock Horns, it's an essential albums debate on the most influential records in the era we call early black metal. Welcome to Lockhorns Banger TV's live weekly metal debate show coming to you from the Banger Bar. A reminder, if you're watching this in the archive, as always, you can watch us live Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern. And please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Okay, we love debates in metal. But there's one genre of metal that gets debated more than any other, and that undoubtedly is black metal. And so this week, we're coming to you with a debate on what are the top 10 essential black metal albums of all time. It's going to get dirty. It's going to get dark. We're going to make this happen. And to help me with this task is Toronto musician Jason Longo, who plays with the band Blood of Christ. Check out this guy in action. All right, well, if that doesn't get us fucking pumped for this, I don't know what was. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, what did we just watch there? Uh, that's uh, me tracking one of our brand new songs called Echoes from the Seventh Dimension. Okay. Uh, it's a brand new uh, Blood of Christ single. Right. Uh, it's coming out in the first week of May. Awesome. So that's obviously what you've been working on. Anything yes. else in the works with Blood of Christ or the other, other bands you're playing um, at the moment? Yeah, mainly focusing on Blood of Christ okay. at the moment. Yeah. I'm also in Corporal Femia. So cool. uh, we have a show on the 28th in Toronto. Yeah. And uh, Blood of Christ is actually doing a couple shows in uh, May with Shed the Skin, which okay. is Kyle from uh, Incantation, his right other band. Yeah, so cool. we're doing a short little run with those guys. Cool. So. Great. Well, good work, man. Thank Not you. A lot of people can bash the skins quite like that. Uh, much respect. Uh, let's go into your story of how you got into black metal music. Uh, tell me how you got down that deep dark uh, hole. Okay, uh, I think it was around 93, 94, somewhere around there. Um, I was in BOC at the time. Mm -hmm. And Jason DeVille, I actually met him in HMV in uh, Westmont Mall in London. Remember those? Yeah. <laughs> um, you mean Jason? <laughs> yeah. I had a Dismember shirt on, I think, at the time. Yep. And he came up to me. He's like, whoa, that's an amazing shirt, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Um, he came out and auditioned. Nailed it, obviously. And yep. uh, he introduced me to the black metal scene, the Norwegian, like uh, Emperor, Satyricon, yep. um, Dark Throne. Yep. So I was instantly grasped by it because of the imagery. Yep. and how dark it was and yep. I was kind of like where, where where are these guys coming from where do they live like we were talking about it earlier yeah. it's almost like they were writing their music in caves or the woods yeah so, and you were saying earlier also that kind of influenced you guys to bring more of that sound into yes, Love of Christ actually, for sure well. yeah we were originally like uh, just a straight up death metal band um, and then yeah we incorporated different elements into it uh, which now we coin uh, the term epic dark metal okay so it's kind of a mixture of black metal 
uh, death metal, a little bit of grind in there almost. Right. So yeah. Shit, we got to do another lock horns now. We got a new debate uh, yeah. on a new genre. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining me on this early black metal. I know that both of us are pretty fond of a lot of these early metal records, it really imprinted on, uh, imprinted on us as uh, young fans of the music. So we'll get into it. But before uh, we do that, I want to give a shout out to everyone that's joining us. Uh, for Lockhorns this week. We want to hear all of your uh, opinions and thoughts on really what are the 10 uh, essential black metal, uh, early black metal albums of all time. It's no easy task. And joining us this week, uh, we've got a lot of Americans uh, joining us. We've got New Jersey, New Mexico, Texas, Ohio, Colorado, California, and uh, a few Canadians uh, scattered across Saskatchewan, <laughs> Scarborough, and North York. We've got all the burbs covered uh, this week. Uh, and people from Belgium, UK, Wales, Netherlands, Iceland, Taiwan, Nepal, Costa Rica, Venezuela, Germany, Sweden, and of course, Norway. No show on black metal would be complete without some Norwegians uh, in the house. So thanks again for uh, joining us. Uh, also in the banger bar, the queen of darkness, Lisa Latasur. I'll take that one. All right. <laughs> yeah. I was working on that all week. <laughs> <I'm good. laughs> uh, and she, of course, is equipped with the cowbell from hell. Which I understand not everyone loves the cowbell from hell, but uh, until you want to send us like, what is it, a 30-inch gong at least that, uh, yeah. uh, we're going to stick uh, with with the uh, cowbell. He said gong. It's a sudden gong. Yeah. I gong, can I, Gongs. I can probably hook that up and get one. Yeah, we got a three-inch gong on the, on the banger bar. Don't know if we can see it right now, but that just doesn't uh, quite uh, cut it. Okay, so I, we think a good place to start off this week, Lisa, right, is to kind of go back to when we debated the early black metal branch and the bands from the heavy metal family tree before we get into the records, yeah? Yeah, a lot of people have been asking us what we mean by early black metal. I mean, that's not the usual, like, nomenclature, right? So right. Um, we had a show when we mm -hmm. talked about this before, and we sort of had, like, proto bands and early bands, and we're going to do sort of the same thing today. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so those early bands, do we have a graphic available for that? Or I think we, we have a, we have a from, graph of what the, that memory. chart looked like. Here we go. The awesome. The okay, there it is. Black metal. So Jason, yeah, way back when we dug into this more, of course, the essential bands. Of course, we've got Venom, Merciful Fate, Bathory, Hellhammer, Celtic Frost. Uh, we had Sarcophago, Mayhem, Dark Throne, uh, Marduk. Satyricon Enslaved, Immortal Gorgoth, Emperor Dark Funeral, and we added along the way, we had Master's Hammer, we had Rotting Christ, we had Burzum and, and Ulver as well. Um, a lot of bands. What do yeah. you feel about that list? Um, I think it's a pretty good list, but uh, it's missing some of some of my favorite ones okay. for sure, yeah. which is Dissection. Okay, okay. Um, um, yeah, but it is a pretty good list. Cool, cool. Um, what in your opinion, you know, sort of defines the sound of this period of metal? Like, what, what would you consider to be the, the real sonic template of it? Of the earlier ones? Yeah, or the, of, of, of the bands and the, and the sound that we're discussing today. Uh, it's just very raw sounding. Yeah. Um, almost like it's recorded on a boom box sure. type of thing. And yep. it gives you a certain feeling. Yep. Um, very evil. Uh, yeah, that's about it. When we were talking earlier, you know, I think what was really interesting about this time in metal, obviously we're going to be spanning quite a broad uh, span of time, a decade at least, but when a lot of metal was really pushing towards like better production, uh, refining the sound, how can you make things sound really as polished as you possibly could, of course, you know, uh, more sound out of Florida being a mm -hmm. good example of that. You had bands uh, like Bathory is a great example, really pushing things in a totally different direction. Yeah, for sure. And we were joking before, yeah. you know, it sounded like that guy was in a cave and we yeah. couldn't figure out what was going yeah. on. <laughs> but I guess that was kind of a relief given that uh, so much of that metal at the time was just becoming more polished. And also, of course, let's remember it was the time of like the birth of the music video. And yep. sort of production value is becoming... Yeah. Huge so, shock value too. Yeah, huge the, shock value. Yeah, whereas um, obviously this stuff coming out of predominantly Europe, and that's an important point here, is that pretty much everything we're going to be talking about today yep. is is coming out of Europe, uh, was, was really coming uh, from a, a very different uh, direction. Okay, 
enough of that. We're going to get into the legend, what we would consider to be the legend album of early black metal. And, and Jason, you've got, some, you've got a strong opinion on what that, that album should be. Uh, my pick would be Immortal, Pure Holocaust. Okay. Okay. That was your guest choice. The legend. Do you want to establish the legend or I'm going to do the legend? Uh, Let me do can. the legend yeah, because go ahead. I love my legends. The legend is Venom Black Metal. Why? Well, because it's in the name, for one. Um, I think we could safely say, I mean, this is obviously 1982. Uh, this is really early. We have to remember this is pre Show No Mercy. Yeah. You know, this is pre uh, Kill 'em All. This is a very early record. So, really, we're talking like Maiden and Priest are kind of the contemporaries. And out of uh, Newcastle, England comes Venom, of course, and a lot has been said of this record. Uh, I remember picking it up on vinyl at Lyle's Records in Victoria, BC, and basically being freaked the fuck out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by what sure. I was holding in my hands. And yeah. I'm sure I wasn't the only one. I'm sure my parents were concerned as well, but had a real, um, had a real dark quality to it. Yeah, I mean, sure. you know, there wasn't really anything at that time that had this really kind of sadistic, this kind of monochromatic visual was something new. It was all about color. It was like number of the beast, yep. you know, and, and, and these records, these record covers that were really kind of how, how epic can we make them? This was almost like stripped down. Uh, your thoughts on this record? Um, yeah, to be honest, I don't think it's necessarily a black metal record. Right, okay. In my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's more of a hard rock, heavy metal. Yep. Um, it definitely started the image. Yeah, for sure. Of black metal and yeah. the evilness and the artwork. Yeah. But as far as the music goes, uh, I would say it's a heavy metal record. Right. That's okay, cool. well, let's go to the board. I mean, I think this is a, this is a snapshot of what we're going to be getting into in this, this episode in the sense that we're going way back to the early 80s. And we know from the chat leading up to today's episode that there's a lot of people that, like you're saying, don't even think black metal has even started no. yet. That really, there's an argument to be made that this is a Nawabum record or this is a thrash record yeah. or a little bit of both. Yeah. It just happened to have a hell of a lot more satanic yeah. imagery and lyrics. The imagery def definitely started with For it. For sure, and they, and they named it. Yeah. So I guess that's something too. But Lisa, we're gonna go to the board. We've got some opinions out there about this record? We certainly do. Okay, here we go. Leonard Reibstein says, Venom aren't my personal faves, but fact is there is no black metal without them. I chose that one because it's the most consistent and worst produced necro. Uh, Artur B. Uh, F. Castanha is back to me. The legend will simply be Venom, Welcome to Hell, slash black metal. The masters have created a foundation for one of the most extreme genres of all time. It was speed and some thrash with satanic lyrics and the imagery that became iconic. Uh, Delicious Dishes is also back. No Venom. Mention them for visuals and name, but honestly, it sounds little to nothing like actual black metal, unlike Sarcophago or Bathory, who are much closer and then we've also got uh, Raymond or Ramen Nicola. I've been talking about not adding Venom for at least one hour. Okay. There's, the chat has been divided. Keep on this going because it's on the board. <laughs> uh, Joaquin G says yes black metal is a black metal album. The end. This is not open to discussion uh, newbies. All the ingredients are there. This is not open to debate new babies. Okay <laughs> well I mean I think this has got a lot to do with one age. How old were you? Or were you even alive when this record right. uh, came out, I think is, is an important factor. My argument for putting it here is, I don't know where else to put it. I don't think it's just a thrash record. I don't think that it's a Nawabum record. I would make the argument that it's actually the beginning of something completely new. But let's see what Raphael Fireblade says. Must, must be here, Venom Black Metal must be here even though it's a proto black metal album. It must be here for its large impact, influencing 90s uh, black metal bands like Mayhem, Emperor, Gorgoroth, and many more. Uh, Tyler uh, Charbonneau says, Black Metal by Venom is the essential black metal album, in my opinion. It may not have been the first album, but it gave the genre its name, and they were the first band to have that purposely raw 
production. I think that there is a, there is a case there, but clearly we've pretty split on this one, Lisa. The good thing is we don't have to worry about it because the legend is like the immunity idol on lock horns. We choose and you suck it up. That's right. Yeah. Move <laughs> on. Wait, wait. We run the show. Uh, Venom, black metal it is. Okay, now we're gonna turn to your guest choice, okay, sorry Jason, that. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, we always want to establish the legend For sure. first, get that out of the way, uh, and then move on. So, your choice. Uh, my choice would be uh, Immortal, pure, yeah. ho pure Holocaust. And, and why this record? I think maybe you might get some pushback on this, just in terms of it might not be the first album that comes to mind for people for early black metal, but why do you love this record? Um, one of the main reasons I love this record is because I'm a drummer, number one. Right. Um, and the drumming on that album is incredible. It's straight, like we were talking earlier, it's straight through. They didn't have any editing then. Mm -hmm. They didn't have, so it was him playing the songs full. And it's a very raw sounding record, um, very evil as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they're one of the first bands, I think, to really incorporate kind of like, almost like a death metal sound. Sure. With the tightness of the guitars and yeah. with the riffs they had. And I, I don't know, I just love Abbott. Yeah. I love his vocals. Yeah, he's fantastic. I mean, very great, unique sounding. A great band. Yeah, it's interesting because I don't think Immortal gets quite as much credit as, say, an, right. an Emperor, yep. uh, for example, or a Mayhem or a Dark Throne. People forget just how uh, yeah. long Immortal's been, been around. Yep. I mean, they've been producing records uh, since the early 90s, and, you know, they had a really great output, and it, you could argue that it was 2002 with Sons of Northern Darkness that mm -hmm. was kind of their biggest record, but it people was, yeah. forget they were already 10 years yep. into making music by yeah, that with point. Blizz Blizz Blizzard Beast is also a really yep. good record. Yeah, right? awesome record. Okay, well, let's see what people have to say about uh, Jason's uh, choice with Immortal Pure Holocaust. Uh, Francis Lefebvre says, Immortal, Pure Holocaust, yes. Okay, Eric Beach says, I'd say 93 is too late for early black metal. Okay, I think this, this week, more than any, we're gonna have debate over, uh, over numbers. What years are we talking about? Eli Martin Unger says, Immortal, Pure Holocaust is what got me into black metal. Okay, a bit of a gateway drug. Uh, super joint, gun to my head, and had to choose between Immortal, Pure Holocaust, and Marduk, uh, Opus Nocturne, I'll have to take the bullet. <laughs> LOL. Tough choice. Wouldn't want to be on that uh, that desert island with you. It would be uh, it would be a tough one for sure. So there you go. I think you know again maybe not um, an obvious choice, but I think it's a good choice because again I think that people don't give Immortal quite the credit right. that they deserve, and they forget that they were there at the beginning with with many of those other bands. Yeah. My turn. Yes, Lisa? It is your turn. There has not been that much chat about Immortal. I don't think people thought of them. Okay. Which makes it a great guest choice because this is where you get a chance to put something on that might not otherwise make it. And so does Sam. For sure. Yes. Uh, and also, uh, before we move on to mine, you know, Immortal, as I mentioned, gravitated into a slightly more death metal sound. Yep. And I think that that's when they became popular. Yep. So people forget that they were much more, quote unquote, pure black metal band in their early For sure. Their, their and early also years. with the production, right? For sure. When they went to Peter Taggart from yep. Hypocrisy. And yep. It yep. just brought it to a whole new that level. That atmosphere yeah. they created. Okay. My turn, my turn, my album's gonna probably be not as popular uh, even as yours because I think this is a, a band, uh, Celtic Frost, Morbid Tales. I brought my own vinyl copy because I'm a super geek. And uh, also because if you look closely enough on this, Daniel, is that I traced this image so many times at school, neglecting my schoolwork, that you can almost see the pencil marks that are literally dug into the cover anyway. One of my favorite uh, covers of, of all time. But there we have the magnet as well. So, 1984, Morbid Tales. Um, I think Morbid Tales is arguably one of the most important extreme metal albums of all time because you can hear hallmarks of black metal, thrash metal, and death metal in, in this record. And I think ten, people tend to have different perspectives on this record, but for me, I think the quality of, of Tom G. Warrior's vocals, for one, the imagery, for two, uh, the, the song titles and the lyric matter was much more occult 
than their thrash or death metal uh, counterparts. And, you know, we wouldn't have Fenris if it wasn't True. for Celtic Frost. Good so point. hugely uh, influential. But let's see what the board says. We got people commenting on, on Morbid Tales. Here we go. Chris Mitchell. That album belongs there, Sam. Well done. Thank you, Chris. Raphael, Fireblade, Celtic Frost, Morbid Tales belongs here for influencing black metal as well as death metal, influencing Dark Throne, Watain, Immortal, and many more. Romulan Rancor. Morbid Tales is fucking... <clears throat> yes, it is. Spike... Uh, spike... Uh, spike... La acid. Like it. Uh, Celtic Frost to make a Thurion is essential to this list. Without Tom G. Warrior's famous... <clears throat> Grunt, the world of metal would be just like the American presidency, a complete shambles. Uh, okay, good. I think to make a theory on, I was listening to it again recently preparing for the show. Uh, they just got a little bit more produced on that record. And I thought that Morbid Tales kind of retained a much more raw kind of yeah. primal sound. I much prefer the sound on Morbid Tales. And I would argue probably even more than maybe black metal when it actually comes to the sound of the record. A lot of those, uh, those early Norwegian black metal records were going after uh, something that... Uh, that this band was producing. I mean, do you, you fond of that record as well? Um, to be honest, not really. Yeah, okay. But I'm on my own here in the studio. Yeah, That's a little all right. bit. <laughs> uh, it, is, it is good, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But for me, it's more, it was more of, Yeah. you know what I mean, the more darker stuff. It's good, well, we're getting there. We're get, we'll, we'll bring the darkness, don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, but before we go there, we're going to a clip, Lisa? Uh, right? Do we have a clip? Yes, we do have a clip from the Banger Vault from uh, Martin. Yeah, so I sat down with Martin Ain, of course, uh, one of early members of, of Celtic Frost, uh, bass player, and when we did the Extreme Metal episode for Metal Evolution, we had this conversation. It was an uh, interesting experience, which I uh, really uh, enjoyed in the beginning, which I thought like, wow, okay. Because they, of course, didn't only try to emulate what we did. But like we tried to begin with, when, with Hellhammer, we were emulating Venom. But we did not want to be Venom. On, a, on the first demo that we released, there was the saying that Venom is killing music. Hellhammer is killing Venom. Well, so we had to get down with Kronos because we were the new ruling elite, you know. And they again did exactly the same they were like you know of course uh, referencing hellhammer i mean you know a drummer named hellhammer with the band mayhem a singer named urinimus which was a song a hellhammer song title of course and uh but made something of their own and on the other hand saying like hey those guys yeah they pussied out they went out you know we we gonna be true we are gonna follow it through we're gonna be the most extreme we're gonna be more extreme than those guys Mm. So to me, the amazing thing with those, with Hellhammer and Celtic Frost still is that we had been black metal and death metal and somewhere on the border of both, you know, still being the same guys. Yeah. It's kind of like a crazy experience, although nowadays people would say death metal that has got nothing to do with black metal, you know, and in the end, it's not true. It's the, the lineage that it comes back from, of course, all ends up with Black Sabbath. Much respect to Martin Ain, love that guy, one of the true legends of underground and extreme metal. Fond memories of sitting down with him there in Zurich a few years ago. Okay, let's move on, Lisa. I think maybe Jason and I have stirred the pot here a little bit by our choices being a little uncharacteristic. And there's a bit of a rallying cry brewing for one band in particular. Yeah, the Lockhorns chat is like... is. The hordes are going to be at the door. They are at the door. So uh, let's let's get to some other bands. Okay. Well, first off, clearly we can't have a conversation about early black metal without talking about Bathory. And I got to say, if it wasn't for Morbid Tales, because I knew no one else would pick it, I would have yeah. probably selected Bathory, uh, one of their records. But let's go to the board. What are people saying? We've got James... Paez, if you're going to have Celtic Frost, you have to add Bathory. Uh, Jotunblot says, seriously, if the next band is in Bathory, we have a problem. 
uh, GTE uh, Cylon says, I'm going to hang myself if Bathory's under the sign of the black mark isn't mentioned. Sodom in the sign of evil. Uh, just my opinion. We haven't talked about Sodom yet. It's true. Uh, Corval the Exterminator says, under the sign of the black market, under the sign of the black mark <laughs> is the legend. The first place where you hear all the elements of later black metal, thick lo-fi atmosphere, epic marching, epic marching rhythms, rasp vocals, dark imagery. Couldn't disagree with you. Uh, Wessel Brookhus is back. Bathory under the sign of the black mark, where Venom, Celtic Frost, and Merciful Fate have influenced the genre lyrically and image-wise. Bathory laid down the blueprint of black metal with this album, Woman of Dark Desires, maybe the first true black metal song of all time, having many of the core characteristics of the genre. We go on. Andy Bass under the sign of the black mark. It was an extraordinary record when it came out. I had never heard anything so fast or evil. For me, it's the template for the for the second wave bands. We were talking about that, Jason. Also totally distinctive from Corthon's later work. Totally agree. A unique musical statement epic. And Superjoint says, The Return. Okay, this is, this is the second uh, Bathory album. As the legend makes more sense to me than any Venom album, Musically wise, Bathory is, is the one band that show everybody else what is black metal and how to play it. Uh, and Metal Thrashing Madman simply says, Bathory, everything by Bathory. Okay, well clearly we gotta get this man yeah. up. Uh, Jason, you wanna let her rip on this album? Uh, yeah, I agree with what they're saying. It's mm -hmm. definitely a raw record. It definitely started the whole, um, the sound, the yeah. evilness and the speed. Yeah, um, for sure. So I definitely agree with this one being yeah, out there. Yeah, absolutely. And again, leading up to the show, I was listening to it, uh, and it threw me right back to yeah. that late '80s time. Of course, this is 1987, I believe. And uh, yeah, it's trying to talk about this record is difficult because the atmosphere that it created at the time yeah. was so unusual. All those songs. Uh, off that record, Massacre, Woman of Dark Desires, and Call from the Grave, just kind of opened with this guy like breathing in, yeah. a ca in what sounded like a cavern, and it just uh, even more so than Venom and, yeah, and, and Morbid sure. Tales. It, from a pure mood, uh, it did something different. It definitely set the tone for the uh, the earlier black metal bands, yeah. like uh, the second wave, I guess you call yeah, it. Yeah, it definitely set the tone for them. Sure, with I the think speed. We could argue that maybe this is the uh, this is the the, the the connective tissue between uh, the first wave and the second wave. Lisa, okay, is that it for Bathory for now? You almost got gone. Uh, I I like getting gone. <laughs> gone away. <laughs> Actually, I don't have a gone, so I can't. The gone is way over there. Um, we do have a lot of bands to get through, and okay. the Mayhem fans are going to have to wait because uh, we want to get through the other early proto first wave bands and really sort that out before okay. we move on. Okay. And the two that have come up the most are right here. Okay, here we go. Um, Horror Master says, Merciful Fates Melissa holds a special place in my heart because it was the album that got me into black metal. I mean, King Diamond's vocals are just amazing. Delicious Dishes, Merciful Fate is a heavy metal band. Let's not stretch too far out when we're already having so little time and place for great records. Okay, uh, so that's, that's, that's Merciful Fate. We've got a magnet, at least for the band. So maybe we'll, we'll fire it up. Tough one, because there's like elements of power metal. Obviously King's vocals are very different than everything else that's going on here. Uh, but it is a difficult band to place because they're not pure thrash. They're not pure death metal. They're not really a no album band. Again, maybe mm. for imagery, yes. you know, I think imagery. when it comes to these proto or early, early black metal bands, what we're really talking about is imagery and, and lyrics uh, and, and the, aesthetic, the overall aesthetic of it. Uh, but we've got more. Uh, Gabriel Fernandez says, Sarcophagos INRI tends to get overlooked. South American band needs to be up there. There along with Mayhem, the bridge between the first and second wave with a totally crushing sound still sounds brutal as fuck. <laughs> also influenced the visual aspects of black metal with the corpse paint and that leather and spikes look so true. Uh, people think that Sepultura was first to the mark uh, mm. down there. They're wrong when it comes to the 
the bullet belts. INRI by Sarcophago is a must-have on the list, a true mono a monolith of the early black metal sound and define the imagery of the genre, a key influence on many other bands even in uh, Norway. I think we had a magnet. We did have a magnet at one time. It's not there, but we got to get Sarcophago up here. I think that definitely Sarcophago, and there's mo many more, even more underground bands. Uh, it's almost like as time has passed, Sarcophago has become, you know, celebrated for what they created because they, I think they tended to get overlooked uh, in those early years, you know, more extreme, obviously coming from South America, was not able to uh, reach as many people as, uh, as the European bands. But there you go, it would be INRI would be the album. And uh, we'll see if it lasts. We may mm. slot Sarcophago in to the top 10. Currently we have four, but we've got a lot more ground to cover. Right, and Lisa. now the Brazilians would want to add Sepultura. Of course. <laughs> you opened that door. Right. Bestial Devastation arguably has a black right. metal vibe. So does Morbid Visions, but we're not going there. Well, it's the hard enough as it is. The chat would really like you to get rid of Merciful Fate. Okay. A well, few people brought it up. All but right. I wanted to see what people thought. It's very clear that that's a no. Okay. I, I agree yeah. with that. So this is no. not yeah. black metal. Oops. It's official. Merciful Fate is not black metal. Uh, you heard it here. We're going to put a question mark because, frankly, where do you put them? Not so sure. Uh, and we'll see about Sarcophago. We've got them off to the side for the moment. Uh, we don't have an INRI magnet, uh, so we'll just go with the logo for now. But Lisa, are we done with the first wave? Are we officially moving on? Yeah, I mean, no one has talked about Hellhammer. No one, no one wants to go there, Sam. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's a lonely world out here <laughs> in the land of apocalyptic raids by Hellhammer. But anyway, uh, what do people want to talk about? They want to talk about Mayhem, and this is the first time where it's really not clear what record yeah. um, we should put on here. Okay, Mayhem. Fuck you. No, I'm joking. Underdog <laughs> Entertainment. Uh, here we go. Uh, Mayhem, uh, De Mysterious Dom Satanas. Something like that must be high up on this list. That album defined the black metal open chord picking style of uh, Euronymous and Snorri Rook. Uh, Hannah Klein says again, Mayhem's, Mayhem's De Mysterious Dome Satanus, the album with the most tragic backstory in the entire scene. But without focusing too much on all the blood and gore, the music is still great, raw, evil, scary, and listenable after more than 20 years with its haunting vocals on tunes like Freezing Moon, Pagan Fears, and, and, and Life Eternal, and an atmosphere of pure desolation. It's true, like, if there's anything close to kind of there being, like, a hit, yeah. it's Freezing Moon. You yep. know, like, this is, like, almost like the national anthem it is, uh, for, for sure. Norwegian black metal. Ray King, I think Live in Leipzig should be the album for Mayhem. Uh, Dead was the best vocalist they ever had, and that album had such a dark and ethereal atmosphere that black metal became known for. And Lisa, we got any other comments coming in there? On uh, we, 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 we've got more comments. Okay. We also have a clip. Okay. So I think... Um, you had talked to uh, Necro Butcher, well, twice. <laughs> yeah. once, once you actually talked to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First time he shouted at me. Yeah. Second time we had a nice conversation over uh, tea, I think, on his patio in, in Norway. So. so we'll go to that clip and then we'll try and figure out what the chat really wants uh, to add from me. Okay, here's me and Necro Butcher getting along. I want to talk about the, the De Mysterious album specifically because it makes a big impact for you guys. Can you, can you talk about that record? It's art by accident more than anything else, I think. Sorry guys, but uh, it's, I love the drums, but of course there's too much drums on there uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and with that very surprising vocal on the top, that was like, nobody heard anything like that before in the metal scene. So it was a lot of strange things happening at one time and come together, it created this strange sound and atmosphere on that album. What do you like about the De Mysterious record? You know, it's very hard to explain yeah. and talk about stuff like this. Uh, yeah. We don't, because we don't plan stuff. No. No. 
know. It's stuff happens. Sure. And when it just happened, we can't sometimes, we can't even explain it ourselves. Sure. But it's our band, it's, <laughs> it's how we sound like, yeah, yeah. and if you like it, that's good. Necro Butcher there, the classic iconoclast wanting the music to speak for itself. Well, he was talking, we did go ahead and put the De Mysterious Dome Satanas magnet on the board because we do have some different opinions out there, but I think most people would argue that this is the critical album. Uh, we've got one more comment here. Uh, Renal Mom says uh, De Mysterious Dome Satanas is the gateway to black metal and time signature. Oh no, we got Rob Naylor uh, says that the Mysterious in full live, uh, it was amazing and Attila killed it as expected. Never felt more like committing a satanic ritual than I did that night. That's a good litmus test for a uh, fantastic black metal experience and time signature MMA says Death Crush is earlier and raw. I mean, without question, it is both those things, but I think if we come down to pure influence, this record uh, does it. Okay, let's step back for a moment. We've actually got half of the albums uh, occupied so far. Lisa, Venom Black Metal, Immortal Pure Holocaust, Celtic Frost, Morbid Tales, Bathory Under the Sign of the Black Mark, and uh, Mayhem, uh, De Mysterious Dom Satanas. <laughs> but there's more albums out there, ain't there, there? There are, and the one other band that it's unclear which record mm. um, is Burzum. Okay, Burzum. So I'm going to Jason Deville first because he's our yeah, friend. Yeah, okay. he knows a lot about that. No shortage of controversy. <laughs> Jason, how you doing, buddy? Here we go. Burzum's Philosophum is easily the most influential black metal album in the grand scheme of things going on to inform several microgenres of black metal. Some may argue that it was released perhaps a few years late to qualify, 96, though it was recorded in 93. It's a good mm. point. Uh, we got another comment here about Burzum. Uh, Spiked Acid says, Burzum's uh, philosophum is more essential than milk on your cornflakes if you catch my drift. Talk about an unblack metal metaphor. Yeah. Uh, here we go, Spencer Gerber. Honestly, I hate Burzum. First album is mostly just a subpar Bathory cover album. Ouch! And the rest of his discography is way over height. Mostly, I don't like the music because it is written by a racist, anti-Semitic, homophobic asshole Whoa. who murdered one of the greatest guitar legends of the genre. Just my two cents. <laughs> Besides, the most influential black metal album is clearly Sarcophago's INRI. Jason, mm. you wanna weigh in on this? Do you agree with your fellow Jason out there? I do, opinion? I do, I do okay. for sure. It All kind right. of it kind of started the whole the whole rawness of, of the second wave. Mm -hmm. um, the drumming on it is incredible as well. Yep. And um, it, it definitely set the tone for the atmospheric yep. and the feeling of Kind of like your Lost in the Woods type yeah. vibe, yeah. Before Emperor, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and I obviously agree. A, a huge shift in the aesthetic, yes. Too like this is it taking taking the imagery uh, towards towards nature, yeah. and it's true. I mean, Jason kind of nailed it uh, that the imagery of this album we see this kind of imagery now, now not only across black metal, but in doom metal and other uh, black gaze, all these sort of micro genres of metal, this sort of idea of, of harnessing uh, the power of nature is really, has a lot of currency in metal today. Uh, Lisa, I mean, I would say that, is there a lot of debate on Burzum? Not a lot, just, no. one, just, just delicious dishes, just one... but he's a regular, so we'll, we'll let him uh, have his uh, two cents. Delicious dishes, for me, it's Dem Som Engang Var, because Philosophum is a good 20 minutes too long. Uh, however, Nick Ottaviano says, uh, uh, Philosophum, despite what you think of Varg and despite what you think of Burzum, this record is a black metal classic. How objective. And the Nova Wolf says that the album Burzum and the album uh, Philosophum must be there. He vis licit tar os is also a huge impact album, but again, first Burzum album is the biggest impact. And by the way, I give free Norwegian lessons if you're looking for them. Uh, uh, so, maybe a little bit of debate on which album, but I think uh, this one comes out uh, the strongest, at least, at least so far. 
But we're still missing some bands. We are. And while I sort of sort through this for a second, someone suggested you rearrange those into an inverted cross. Oh. While, while we're doing this. All right. <laughs> we cut to the next clip. We will. <laughs> uh, um, I, think, I think it's time, though, to talk about Dark Throne. Okay. Yes. It's time. Yeah. It's been far too long. Uh, yeah, we're, like, we're like half an hour into the show. Yeah, here. How'd that happen? Yeah. It's 4.45 and we haven't even talked about Dark Throne. Here we go. Thrash Maniac 99. Dark Throne. D deserve a spot for sure and for my money a blaze in the northern sky is the most essential their first black metal album and it was the first norwegian black metal full-length album ever created interesting leonard reimstein says a blaze in the northern sky by the mighty dark throne black metal to me always means three adjectives primitive epic dark no band uh did dark throne invent the wheel no but no black metal band of the early years made it made it roll like them. I like that. Every raw slash crust slash punk black metal band since owes homage to this beast of an LP. Delicious Dishes, Blaze in the Northern Sky would be my Dark Throne pick as well. Though Transylvanian Hunger has a chance if we go by quality instead of time. Jason, what do you think? I got, we got Blaze in the Northern Sky here. Would you agree? Does yes, this deserve for to be sure. In the top ten. Yeah, it's definitely it definitely set the tone for a lot of Norwegian bands. It's a very dark record. Yeah. Um, yeah, with the imagery and everything, they kind of started a whole different yeah. image, right? I'm really and I really hear like a direct yes. line here, and to some extent here, <clears throat> but more so here. I mean, for me, uh, yeah, I'm mean, I mean, agree. Immortal doesn't get the credit, but I think. Dark Throne is the band that, that, again, really seems to pick up on this, this sort of, this primitive uh, feeling that you got in Bathory, and then prior to Bathory, there wasn't really anybody. And so I think it's really Dark Throne that, that continues that tradition. Of course, Dark Throne has gone on to do all sorts of different things. I was just going to mention that. The uh, new record is amazing. Yeah. And you they're know, still, they've, still. They've woven in and out of the kind of primitive black metal yeah. thing and into more of the kind of uh, classic Nawabum sound as well. But I don't think there's really much dispute. And talk about a freaky ass cover. Like, whoever yeah. thought of just putting like a photo of a guy on your cover that was just taken by your buddy's camera. Yeah. But something about it, actually, it's like, it is like a B horror movie it cover. It is very mysterious, too. You don't yep. know. Another thing with this is, too, you don't really know where they recorded it. You don't know how they're doing this stuff, and it's straight through. Right. It has that them. mystery. Again. Yes. And it's probably mystery. a key thing that the bathroom, like, was it one guy? Was it a bunch of guys? Yeah. Is it two guys? Is it one guy? What exactly yeah. is going on uh, with that record? But without question... The mood on that record is unlike any other. Lisa, anything else on Dark Throne? Yeah. Okay, Yarda Bumofo says that Blaze of the Northern Sky, uh, Yarda Black Metal Mofo, Bla Blaze of the Northern Sky is super rocking. Not sure that would be the adjective I would choose, <laughs> but Transylvanian Hunger is a much more evil and hopeless sounding record. It's a good description for a good, yeah, a good black metal should make you feel as hopeless as possible. Now, I put this here, this even is not though... This Hammerfall. Even <laughs> though, um, I mean, the way this works is we have a sense in advance of, like, who people want to talk about. That's when we get the magnets printed up. Yeah. Although we could have photocopied all of these, uh, actually. We should have. And it would have turned out okay. Yeah. Um, we got both Dark Throne uh, albums done just in case. Also, because yeah. I like that one. Yeah. So, uh, but not a lot of love in the chat for that really? one. Really? Transylvania Hunger. Yeah. yeah no one's mm. asking for two Dark Throne. Well, there you go. Mm. Well, let's move on. I'm all for a consensus most of the time. But uh, yeah, I would agree. I think. Again, the hallmark for me is always influence. I think this was clearly establishing, uh, uh, was was building on it. But I think that this this album by far was was the most was the most influential. For sure, they you started know. to change their sound with this one. That's where they started to grow. Exactly, exactly. Uh, okay, Lisa, what's next? Um, a bunch of bands. Let's just see what what pops up. Okay, here we go. Leonard Reimstein is back. Before this list gets overstuffed with Norwegian albums, I'm going to push for the darkest, rawest, most cult of all records, Drawing Down the Moon by Beherit. Don't even know if I'm pronouncing that properly. Its strange mix of minimalist synths and primitive blasting has been a major influence on both raw black metal and contemporary death metal. The overall concept of moon worship 
gives it an eerie occult vibe. If you can listen to Solomon's gait and not bang your head, then you need to check your neck. <laughs> okay, well, let's put Beharit off to the side. Obviously, very passionate articulation there, but the question is really, are we gonna get any consensus on it being one mm. of the most, one of the essential or most influential albums? Uh, yeah, there's one band here, Lisa, that I'm surprised we haven't got to yet. Emperor. Emperor. Yeah? Yeah. Here, here we go. Hannah Klein, for me, Emperors in the Night Side Eclipse must be on this list. Yep. A work well ahead of its time and still revolutionary. Simply essential. Arturus Felipe Castanha, I will defend Emperor in the Night Side Eclipse for their use of orchestral sound, ambience, and other elements that later influenced other genres. Um, there's no question that this album... Sorry. Really, um, we got the magnet for it here. Yeah. We talked about this with symphonic black metal. I mean, this album is another opening, another gateway to somewhere else, and that is uh, the symphonic element. Yeah, it is. Element. It, it uh, definitely started that. Give me, give me your thoughts on that. Right? I definitely agree with that being up there. It, yeah. it started the whole symphonic, like you said. Yeah. Um, but yet it still has the, the evilness to it and the, yeah. and the black metal feel to it. Yeah. But it opened up a lot of doors for other bands. Yeah. Right. And it, you know, it's interesting. I mean, influences. there was elements of that kind of like keyboard driven. Yes. Uh, you know, dark classical vibe, sort of really just peeking through yeah. on this record. Nothing sophisticated. Nothing that was really part of the the fabric of the songwriting. And the but, covers. The but, cover is incredible. Yeah. Too. Enter Ishan and company and you have this whole other possibility opened up for for black metal and it really is the beginning of that split that we've talked about before where you get a genre that's largely based on creating something that's truly primitive and stripped down and now someone's taking it in another direction it still has a raw quality to it but there's something very sophisticated about yeah. this record and that's probably the first time we use that word <laughs> to describe black metal was with this um with this album i think we've got more on emperor lisa yeah you're not you're not going to find any debate on this yeah one. i think we've got consensus eli martin unger says emperors in the night side eclipse is the ultimate black metal album and the best black metal album of all time Ooh. fighting words Okay. It's also Craig Mailman's favorite cover of all of these. Is that right? It's one of my favorite covers working, of all time. Working in the too. back room. I'm just like, am I just like so, I'm primitive. I can't, I like morbid tales. I like my sketch art. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, let's step back. Well, we've added a few bands. What have we got so far? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the ten. I think there's some discussion as to whether Sarcophago, INRI, deserves to belong. If you think Sarcophago needs to be in the top 10, pipe up now, because we're actually starting to run out of time. We've had, uh, we've had a few comments on uh, Beharit, that that deserves to belong. We've decided that Merciful Fate does not belong in early black metal. Transylvanian Hunger is sort of a close second to a blaze in the northern sky when it comes to um, uh, Dark Throne. So Lisa, we get some more comments on... On Beharit. You might want to draw a little arrow from them over to the list or okay. move them over. Okay. Because there's uh, quite a few people piping up for that one. I like this tag. Hordes of Nebula <laughs> says that Beharit's drawing down the moon belongs here without a doubt. Way off the charts in terms of sound but that is what makes it so influential. Dark vibes, raw sound, and ambient passages. Good comment, hordes. Alan Ketzer Lugarini says, no, no, on the side, no, put a magnet for Beharit, Carne Verde. Yeah, Beharit is true with a V. Okay, well, Beharit. I don't know much about that band, to be honest. I've caught the uh, the host and guest a little off guard because this is a band that we don't really know that well, but it definitely seems that this is sort of a bit of a an unsung hero, if you will, of the early black metal albums. Sarcophago is still there. Anything else coming in, Lisa? Yeah, one person <laughs> arguing persistently for uh, Ulver. 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 Yeah. Okay. Spike Dacid is back. I just call you Spike Dacid because I don't know how to say the rest of it. <laughs> Ulver's Burgtat 
is such an influential album, it birthed atmospheric black metal and black gaze. In cooking, meals start with onions and garlic, so black metal meals start with ulver. Okay, well, we've mm. got a vote there for ulver. I might argue, just based on going back to the earlier chat, we did have more comments coming in for sarcophago INRI. Uh, yeah, we did. One, one man does not make a chorus, so we'll see how things go here. Lisa, are we ticking down? We are, but uh, there is more um, rallying around Beharit. Okay, delicious dishes. Beharit is essential and earlier than all Norwegian black metal bands with the Oath of Black Blood. Now, I'm not sure if that's... It's a different record, It's a different right? record. It's not the consensus. What was it called? The Drawing of Dark Moon, I think it was. Correct me if I'm wrong. That seems to be the one that people are um, choosing. Hmm. People aren't choosing Hellhammer, but I'm just going to put it up there anyway because they fucking rule. Uh, just because I get to do those sorts of things. Well, no one... Uh, there's a few people talking about Hellhammer. People have asked, where is Satyricon? Okay, and Satyricon. You tell us. Great, great point. Satyricon, another Norwegian black metal band that's been around for a long time. Time. Yeah, nem, nem, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Nemen, Nemenis Davina? Yeah, Nemenis it, Davina, Nemesis yeah. Davina. I mean, I think that, um, interesting point. I think we may be validated though here, Lisa, in joining these two phases because if we can't build consensus on this, on these ninth or tenth records, maybe we've kind of, we've kind of got it. Uh, if we had left out Venom Black Metal, Celtic Frost, and certainly Bathory, there would probably be uh, a lot of opposition. So, what have we got? We still got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think we're gonna add Beharit. That's nine. Oh, well, here's a new one. I is think. Is it uh, Jason, I think Jason might have. This is gonna to make say Jason Longo happy. Frank Hung G C says dissection started the whole melodic black yep. thing. Also incorporating death elements. They're definitely essential in terms of sound. And influence you. You think dissection deserves to be dissection here. deserves to be up there for sure. And which which record? Um, Storm in the Lights, please. And what 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 does dissection do differently than than? The um, they incorporated thing? the melodic element. Yeah. Into yeah. the music, and it was almost like a mixture of thrash, black metal. Yeah. And there's a lot of different melodic feels to it sure. as well. So I I definitely think that deserves to be up there. It's a fantastic record, and yeah. it really stands apart. But I think probably the reason why we're not seeing a lot of support for it is it did have all those other elements in True. it. It had that melodic element, the slightly more thrashy vibe, but Yannick Bauer says that dissection of the Somber Lane or Storm of the Lights it's Bane uh, deserves to be up here. So, I mean, we've got a band, but we've also got a lot of dispute on which record. And that often makes it more difficult when there's not like a runaway record. Uh, like in the case of, of say, uh, Nightside Eclipse. All right, so this is what we like to call the lightning round here, like just like the last gasp okay. of arguments, pipe people. We're boiling down to it now. Metal Thrashing Madman, Satyricon, the Shadow Throne. If you do not choose it, I will Varg Vikernes my nearest church. <laughs> I think it's the first time I've heard Varg Vikernes used as a verb, <laughs> Yeah. which doesn't give me a lot of hope for the world. Let's but that's not, another. Let's not Lockhart. say we did. <laughs> uh, I got a miniature church that we could sell you. <laughs> uh, don't smell any burning, so I think we're okay. I'm not sure if Shadow Throne is going to make the cut. I would argue that so far, uh, Sarcophago would probably be the uh, the running favorite for the tenth slot. However. Jerome Faria says that Natin's Madrigal from Uver deserves a spot. It was the first of its kind, and even Dimu Borgir would not exist without the influence of that record. Okay, so Uver, kind of a late, hmm. a late runner here. Again, just like um, Dissection or Satyricon, we're not getting a lot of consensus on the actual album, which in my t opinion makes it difficult for it to make a case as being an essential album. There's not a clear favorite in the catalog. It's a tough call. Frost. Frost. Enslaved Frost. Jason saying Enslaved Frost. Let's see if there's any takers out there. I'm just going to jot down Enslaved here. One of my all-time faves. And again, you know, probably similar to um, Immortal. Yeah. A band that people tend to forget where they where they actually started, which was very much rooted 
in that early uh, black metal yep. sound in Norway. Lisa, there's uh, a blank screen staring at me. <laughs> I here. know, I know, because it's... Uh, I'm a deer caught in headlights here. It's a, it's a lot of the same thing. Uh, I think we're kind of wrapping up, but clearly sarcophago is a yes. Clearly sarcophago is a yes. Well, I think that, I mean, we're getting random shout outs for Marduk, Dissections, Satyricon, Sodom, we've heard of Master's Hammer. Uh, people saying Immortal needs to be removed. Enslaved Frost, you're getting some support there, Jason. Uh, Marduk, uh, Enslaved, definitely Enslaved. Um, Slayer, Rotting Christ. Dissection, I go on. So many bands. Jason is right. I think it would be down, well, it's, it's either Ulver, Enslaved, or Sarcophago. I might eliminate Ulver for the fact that there's no clear consensus on which album it should be. Whereas Enslaved Frost, definitely there's some consensus there. And Sarcophago, uh, INRI, there's consensus. A so, lot more comments on Sarcophago than any of those other Okay, records. so maybe we just, we, we, we pass by it over uh, quite early in the show. Okay, it's official. Not only that, uh, the drummer Trim yes. from Enslaved that's on this record is now an emperor. Right. Right? Yeah, and so part of the he's an, he's an incredible drummer. A remarkable drummer, no question. Lisa, have we done it? I think we've done it, although it isn't shaped like an inverted cross yet. Nor is it very tidy. <laughs> it's not tidy. Okay. It's messy. Let's do a quick review. Venom Black Metal voted not without controversy as the legend album. Some di dispute on whether it actually is black metal, whether it should be there just because of its imagery and its title. Uh, we had the guest choice, Pure Holocaust from Immortal. My choice, Celtic Frost, Morbid Tales. Then we had overwhelming consensus on Bathory, especially under the sign of the Black Mark. A lot of consensus around Mayhem, uh, just Mysterious, Domus Satanus, Burzum, Dark Throne, Blaze in the Northern Sky. I think these are kind of no-brainers. Uh, Emperor in the Nightside Eclipse, another no-brainer. And I think really it came down to what's going to fill those last two spots. Early in the show, we had a lot of rallying cries for Sarcophago, INRI, of course, the South American band that tends to get overlooked, but they were in there super early and people forget. And then we've got uh, Beherit as probably like the surprise go home and do your homework kind of band. Uh, perhaps the band that, that gets overlooked the most in the canon of black metal. Lisa, did we do it? I think we did it. Okay. Thank you, nice. sir. Thank you very much Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me, me Jason. Yeah, it was fun. Jason Longo, check out Blood of Christ. This man knows how to play the skins. We've got Lisa, Daniel, uh, Andrew, and Craig on off camera. Thanks for making it happen. Subscribe to Banger TV, please. Lockhorns next week. Uh, you've asked for it, and we're doing it. Uh, we're doing our death slash doom episode, and joining me is our first comedian. Prepare to laugh. I can't <laughs> wait for this. My co-host will be Blaine Smith. Thanks for joining me on Lockhorns. We'll see you next time.